Welcome to the IEF Lecture Series. We're so glad that you're joining with us and we pray that you'll be blessed as you receive from this teaching. Good news is um, the Chief Operations Officer, and he might tell us what that actually means, uh, for the Nazareth Baptist School. And you also, you, you head up or chair the Convention of Evangelical Christians in, uh, in Israel. And um, you've written, uh, Boutros has written a couple of books. Is it just two? Have you written more than? Uh, in, two in English. Two in English, right. Well, and, uh, two, two in Arabic also. Uh, when the Saviour is Your Neighbour, which is a kind of uh, biographical book, but, but trying to look at some of the issues that face uh, a Christian, as it describes an Arab, Israeli, Palestinian Christian, is how the book describes uh, Boutros and just trying to live in the kind of tensions of that. It, it really is a, a fascinating insight with lots of really insightful looks into scripture on the way through. And then your more recent book, Looking from the Precipice, which is perspectives, again, of a Palestinian, Christian, evangelical. And, and really it's that kind of thing that we, we just love to, to hear from you this evening, Boutros. And um, we'll hand over to you in a moment just after we've, we've prayed. We'll just go straight over to, to you. Thank you. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be together. Uh, thank you for your presence with us wherever we are. Thank you that you promise to be with us by your spirit to make the Lord Jesus real to us, to teach us more of him and to draw us on in our discipleship. And that, that's our deep desire. It's not just to fill our heads with information. Uh, not just to learn new things, but to be stimulated in our following of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray that you would use this time to do that, we ask. Bless Boutros as he speaks to us, and that as we engage with him, uh, there would be a real sense of fellowship uh, in which he feels encouragement as well as, as well as us. So thank you, Lord, for this time. We give it to you and ask that we would be good stewards of the opportunity you've provided for us this evening. As we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening again, everybody. Nice to be with you. Um, uh, I, you know, I asked John, I wanted to just recently what the profile of the people here, and he said there's a wide range of people uh, with, uh, you know, different knowledge of Israel, people less, people more. Um, so uh, I'll be sharing a lot of background uh, information, um, which might be helpful for some, maybe less helpful for other people. Anyway, uh, we can go, um, maybe I'll cut my sharing a little bit instead of an hour, as I was told, maybe I have 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll give time for questions, and then I can go in other directions. Because as you know, of course, Israel is a very interesting place, uh, very complicated also, and complex uh, place. So uh, I can share about different things uh, from my perspective uh, living in this country. Anyway, I'll uh, have my PowerPoint on. Yeah. Oh, that's great. A little bit of uh, information about myself. Butros uh, means Peter, by the way. We have a Peter with us, so I'm Peter also. Uh, Butros in Arabic, uh, we don't have a P, we have a B, so it's Butros. I'm a lawyer also, we have a lawyer with us also. Uh, I'm a director of Nazareth Baptist School. Um, I'm also a writer, I write, I'm an ordained elder in the local Baptist church. I've been involved in the last 30 something years in different boards, um, Advocates International, Nazareth Village, some of you might know they are affiliated and they are on the grounds of uh, uh, the Scottish Hospital in Nazareth, uh, EMMS, Edinburgh Medical Mission Society Hospital. Uh, there is a Nazareth village. I was one of uh, the founders. I was on the board that founded the place. Also, seminary, Musalaha, the Re Reconciliation Ministry. Uh, also, for some time on Israel Educational Forum, IEF, uh, with John, I was on the board and was active on the educational section of IEF. Uh, and uh, today I had, uh, this is my fourth year, I had uh, a convention of evangelical churches in Israel, uh, as well as other things. This is my, uh, an old family of, uh, an old picture of my family, not a recent one. 
to always prefer old ones where we look better than, than today. Uh, that's my wife, Adia. She's an education counselor. She's the one we're in red, of course. Uh, Lama, uh, she's a student in Oxford University. She just finished her master's. She's a Rhodes Scholar. And uh, Atallah, my son, is a medical doctor, just uh, started his uh, internship uh, as a doctor in Haifa. And the little one, she's not that little today, she's 18 now. Uh, she just finished high school. Okay, I studied at the Hebrew University. Uh, at that time, I met uh, John, 91, I finished uh, law, first degree in Hebrew University. I joined the Bar Association and became a lawyer in 93. I did an MBA in 2009. I did a certificate to teach uh, civics for whatever it's worth also recently. I'm general director of Nazareth Baptist School. They changed the, the job description, operation manager, in order to distinguish it from uh, principals of the school uh, also recently. Uh, I've been the chairman of the Convention of Evangelical Churches. Okay, so these are pictures of uh, the books I wrote. Uh, the last one on the left is uh, looking from the principles. This was uh, published just in March 2021. Uh, Paraclete Press in America published that uh, during COVID. So uh, yeah, anyway, you can uh, order it if you like from Amazon. Okay, I got to know Jesus uh, through uh, being a student in Nazareth Baptist School in 1979. And uh, I did not find any other better definition of where I stand. It's just, uh, you know, maybe like all of us, I'm trying to walk faithfully with the Lord. Okay, Israel, a holy land. What, what makes it uh, interesting? Why are people interested uh, in uh, in Israel or Holy Land or Palestine, whatever, we will not enter into the differences. Of course, it's the land of our Lord, the land of the Bible. Also, it's a crossroad, you know, between Asia, Europe, and Africa. Uh, because of boycotts from Arab countries, Israel plays the football, for example, with Europe. But at the same time, it's uh, in Asia, but it's on the edge of a Asia. And it's also very close to Africa. Egypt is actually in Africa. So it's really in a very strategic place. Strategic importance in the whole world, especially to the US. Uh, it's also an end day scheme involved, you know, the last days. Uh, different people say different things about what's gonna happen here, different interpretations of uh, Revelation and the book of Daniel and so on. It involves uh, Israel and the Jewish people. It's also important for the three uh, monotheistic faiths. You know, of course, Christianity, we know about it. Judaism, we also know about it. This is uh, uh, the land of the patriarchs and the prophets and so on. It's also uh, important and sacred for the Muslims. Uh, Jerusalem is considered the third most holy place for the Muslims as well. So it is important for the three monotheistic faiths. Uh, it's the only Jewish state uh, in the world, which makes it, to say the least, the most an interesting experience. Um, we, we have uh, countries that have a, a Christian majority and a Muslim and so on and so on. This is the only one that has a, uh, a Jewish it's a Jewish state and it has, a, as I'll share later, a minority of Arabs, Christians, and Muslims also in it. And also because of the conflict, you know, that has been going on more than 100 years uh, in this area, that makes it also quite interesting. You know, when I share with groups, they, you know, I need a little bit to justify why I am sharing all these things about our life here, because some, sometimes people come to our country and want to hear about us, but they I uh, don't want to hear a lot about our history or our struggles or our challenges. They just want to jump in to hear about spiritual side, what they see as spiritual side, uh, as if, you know, other things are not important. But if you want to love somebody or you want to love a people or uh, sympathize with a people or play, pray for uh, people, you, you should know their challenges and uh, you should know their dreams, their difficulties in order to um, I think this is what Jesus even did 
when he was incarnated, he came to our world in order to, uh, and he knew as well, he knew all our difficulties, and then he could uh, die on the cross. So also as believers, this is, uh, this is important. And you know, when we talk about um, Arabs, I'm an Arab, and you are Westerners from different places, most of you, um, maybe the, my culture has different values than yours, I'm putting aside the faith component, but I'm saying as Arabs or as the Scottish or as American, uh, we have different values. We have different politics, of course. But at the end of the day, you know, according to Ephesians, he says that we in Christ have become a new man in Christ or a new woman in Christ. He has broken the uh, wall of barrier between us and has made, it, has, has made us one in him. And I believe that the blood of Christ makes us one. You know, it's, uh, this is not biblical, but it's, uh, it's an illustration I like. You know, in, uh, in Arab, uh, Arabic uh, films or Indian films, uh, there's always this scene, you know, where two brothers are in conflict and uh, they struggle, they don't talk to each other. And then when the father is dying, they come to his, uh, his bed and he's, he's dying and he asks them to reconcile. And they reconcile, they, uh, you know, they hug each other. And then in our uh, culture, people say, oh, uh, water does not become, uh, sorry, blood does not become water. This is what we say. And I think you have the same saying also, that at the end of the day, because they have a blood relationship, they are a bro uh, two brothers or a brother and a sister, they, uh, they are one, they are from one father and mother, uh, then uh, that... Um, connects them and bounds them together. And I'm taking it one step further and saying as believers, we have the blood of Christ makes us one, makes us faith inside. So this is why we, you know, if you want to hear about us, you need to know what we believe because we're one in Christ and what our challenges are because of this special bond that we have the blood of Christ. Okay, information, general information about Israel. It's a small country, very small country, 21 square kilometers. I don't know in miles how much that is, 9,000 or something, 9,000 miles, probably square miles. Uh, the white side is Israel proper. The um, uh, orange uh, side in, uh, in the middle is West Bank. Of course, it's full with uh, settlements now, Jewish settlements, but it's actually the West Bank, which is an Arab-occupied uh, area that I'll talk about a little bit later. Of course, you have Egypt and Jordan, which is separate, but uh, uh, Israel has uh, 9.25, a little bit more than, two, than 9 million people in Israel. And a lot of people don't know that uh, it's not 100% Jewish. It has 75% are Jewish. Of course, it's a Jewish country. And according to the, its definition, it's Jewish and democratic. That causes the problems in itself, because when you say Jewish, you are talking about exclusive Jewish. When you say he's Jewish, then it's, you know, exclusive, exclusive Jewish. But uh, democratic has also in it a dimension of uh, diversity and inclusiveness of other people. So that causes some tension, uh, just the... Uh, comment here on that. So 75% are Jewish, 21% are Arab, Palestinian. I use also Palestinian. Some people would just say Arabs in Israel. And 4% are foreign workers or people, you know, from abroad who don't have uh, citizenship, uh, who live in the country, about half a million people, maybe less, less than uh, Among the Arabs, among the 21%, uh, it's mainly Muslim, 85% of them are Muslim, 8% uh, of the 21% are Christian, and 7% are Druze. And these are the numbers. So 9.25 million people, about 7 million Jewish, about 2 million uh, Arabs, and the rest are uh, foreign workers. Among the, the Arabs, about 1.7 million are Muslims, and uh, 135,000 are Arab Christians. Uh, I should distinguish that. There's another 40,000 uh, 40, additional Christians who are not Arab. 
uh, you know, people who, according to the, the law of return, are, are, were able to do Aliyah, were able to come and live in Israel, but they are not proper Jewish, according to the halakha, according to the Jewish law. So uh, let's see if you have uh, people who are good in math. What is the percentage of the Arab Christians in Israel? Anybody can guess? Calculated guess? I'm going to take my talk. Hundred and thirty-five thousand out of nine point two five million. It's one and a half percent. I'll make it easier for you. One and a half percent are Christians. I'm talking about Christians in the broad sense of the word. Um, in, in the West, you use different uh, different term. When you say Christian, you mean you know is a believer, is a church goer, is a committed Christian, whatever. Uh, here. It's more of a sociological type of uh, definition. And Christian, you could be an atheist Christian or nominal, of course. A large number are nominal and, you know, would, would go to church maybe three times uh, to be baptized, to get married, and to be buried. That's it. They do not have any other relationship to uh, a church, but they are considered Christian. So I'm including here everybody. So anybody feels uh, an urge to ask me about a specific thing, you know, just uh, unmute yourself and just uh, interrupt me. It's okay. It's, uh, um, I'm fine with it. Okay. That's John Woodhead coming in. Let's admit John. That's a good idea. Okay. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of uh, history. Uh, Although it's very political, this history that I'm sharing, I'll, I'll try to be uh, very objective, you know, just stating the facts of uh, what happened. Uh, I'm not going back 2,000 years ago. I'm going back 130,000 years, uh, 130 years ago only, uh, just to give people who do, do not have an idea about what this conflict is about, just a little bit of a, a taste or understanding of it. 130, 140 years ago, there were about half a million people living in Palestine. Uh, Jews since the year 70 uh, AC uh, were in exile. There was a very small minority of about 5,000 people uh, who lived in Palestine, in three places, in Jerusalem, in Hebron, and in Tzfat, in the north. Uh, the inhabitants of Palestine at that time were the Muslims and Christians, 85% Muslims, 10% Christians. Uh, the Palestine, like most of the Middle East, was under the Ottoman, the Turkish rule at that time. At that time, uh, Jews around the world, especially in Europe, actually, and not in uh, Middle Eastern countries or uh, North African countries, but in European countries, were facing uh, persecution, difficult persecution, uh, especially in Russia. Uh, there were, uh, they were uh, being uh, persecuted and... Uh, attacked uh, badly. At that time, uh, this guy uh, that you can see in uh, my PowerPoint, uh, Benjamin Herzl, uh, he's a lawyer, uh, also a journalist from Vienna, also lived some time in, in Bucharest. He wrote a, a book called uh, The State of the Jews, The State of the Jews, a visionary book where his claim was that because of what was happening with the Jews, the persecution that they were suffering from, it could be stopped only if the Jews had their own country and they were gathered again, and that country would be like a refuge place for them, a shelter for them, and they would not be uh, attacked uh, anywhere else. Um, this, this is why Herzl is the visionary for the Zionist movement. His book became, as a result, uh, the Zionist movement, the Jewish Zionist movement was uh, created. At the same time, there was the Christian Zionist movement or uh, dispensationalism also uh, started almost at the same time, uh, also claiming and saying that the Jews should uh, be back and be gathered as part of the scheme of the last days. So, um, fast forward, this Zionist movement, uh, which had some healthy sponsors, uh, Rothschild family and others was 
and started helping Jews to uh, come to Israel. By the way, in the beginning, uh, it was not, they did not decide that this place would be Palestine, the place that the Jews will have their, their state, uh, according to uh, the book, uh, Herzl's book. But uh, Nigeria was mentioned, uh, Argentina was mentioned, but uh, the voice that said Palestine is, is our ancient homeland, we should go back to our ancient homeland according to the promises that God gave Abraham. So all of us should be gathered over there uh, again. They started coming back and uh, to Palestine at that time. And um, their motto was, uh, we are a people without a land coming to a land without people. That was their motto. The problem was that the second part of uh, this sentence was not true, that the, the land had people in it. It had Palestinians, Arab Palestinians living there. Simple people, most of them farmers and so on, but it did have uh, people. So they started coming, they were wealthier, so they bought lands. And as a result, the inevitable happened and clashes started between the Jews who had their uh, national aspirations. They wanted to create uh, their own country. And Palestinians who lived there and, of course, saw these foreign people coming from all around the world and sometimes buying their land and sometimes, you know. Uh, so uh, there were um, clashes between them. That was in the 20s, 30s. Uh, later on, the British mandate was over. Uh, sorry, the, the Ottoman uh, rule was over and the British mandate came in its place. The, and uh, the British rule here, and uh, in, of course, the Holocaust, the German uh, awful Holocaust against the Jews just accelerated the return and the uh, coming and traveling of the Jews to Palestine uh, over here. The British mandate was over, and what was then like the UN, in the Charter of the Nations, they decided that uh, in 1947 that the land would be uh, divided between uh, the Arab Palestinian nation, uh, national um, movement and the Jewish Zionist uh, movement, almost 50 50, almost. The Arabs refused it, rejected the plan. The Jews were delighted with it, they were dancing in the streets, they were happy with it. In retrospect, you know, you would say, oh, how dumb were the Arabs, they did not accept it today. They are begging for very little land and they are not uh, accepting it, but uh, uh, the, the Arabs will tell you, you know, if uh, you're living at your home and somebody comes and uh, settles in your home and then he says, let's divide it between us, you will not accept it either. But anyway, that, that's what happened. So they rejected it and as a result, there was the war, 1948 war. To make it simple, the Jews won the war, the Arabs lost the war. And so what happened to these Palestinian Arab Palestinians uh, that lived over there in 1948? That's a big question and that will lead me to what group I am part of. There are three groups of Palestinians. Um, if you take the ones that lived in 1947, let's say, or 46, in Palestine, what happened to them? Uh, we'll start from the last one, but actually from the one in the middle. Uh, there were people, there were 420 villages that were evacuated or people who were displaced during the war in 1948. 420 Palestinian villages. Uh, here you will see an argument uh, the Jews will say, oh, we ran away because they were afraid of the war. The Palestinians will say, no, they were dragged out by the Jewish troops and they were thrown out of the country. The, um, the truth probably is somewhere in, in between. You know, in some cases, it was really they ran away. In other cases, it, it was uh, uh, the Jewish troops came in and had a massacre and people ran, uh, left or so. So that's the first group. And they left mainly to Jordan to Lebanon, to Syria, and well as other places, or it was like a transit, you know, they would go to Lebanon and later on to Europe or to America or to Latin America even, Australia. Today you have Palestinians all around the world. 
In Jordan, the Palestinian refugees became uh, Jordanian citizens later on. Today, you will not see big difference. Yeah, if you go to Jordan, people will tell you, ah, I am originally, my family is from Jaffa, from Haifa, uh, but uh, they, they became citizens over there. In Lebanon, uh, not exactly citizens, but uh, with lots of disadvantages and so on. Uh, Syria also, and they are the groups that are sometimes the weakest in uh, a society. For example, in the war, the Syrian war, uh, civil war that they had uh, there, the Palestinians in the refugee camps in Syria were the ones that were hit uh, mostly. So today when you hear, when they talk about talks, peace talks, which they don't recently sort of put aside the Palestinian issue, but when they talk about refugees problem, they talk about these people who are all around the world that are originally, or maybe a large number of them have passed away, we're talking about 72, 73 years ago, but their descendants live in these countries. And sometimes they say, oh, we will accept maybe 100,000 can come back and live maybe just in the West Bank and not in other places, or maybe some kind of compensation. So that's one group. The other group, let's see, um, 1948, the, um, Israel was established, but these areas here in green, the West Bank, uh, East Jerusalem, uh, Gaza Strip, if you can see them, I'm going to make them large a little bit, you see. The West Bank, which started, uh, just, uh, I'm, I'm over here in Nazareth and uh, Jenin is in the northern part of the West Bank, and of course, Hebron is in the southern part. Uh, of course, Gaza is uh, near the sea here in the um, southwest of uh, Palestine. Uh, anyway, um, in 48, these areas, the West Bank was given like a custody to the um, Jordanians. The, Jord the king, the Hashemite kingdom, was responsible for it, and they were ruling it, 1948. And the Gaza Strip was given to Egypt. In 1967, a war um, between uh, Israel and uh, Syria and Egypt, a, a big war. And uh, as a result, Israel um, occupied Sinai. In the meantime, they have returned it back to Egypt. Sinai is down here. Um, I don't know if you see the cursor. Do you see the, the cursor also? Do you see it or you don't see it? No, you don't see it. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, where you have Egypt, that's Sinai down there. Um, so um, Israel occupied that later on with the peace uh, treaty with Egypt, they returned, uh, returned it all. The Golan Heights is up. Um, uh, let me show it here like this. Uh, the Go Golan Heights, the green part here in the northwestern. Uh, northeastern part of uh, Palestine. Also, Israel occupied that from Syria, and it also occupied the whole West Bank and Gaza. Okay, uh, and East Jerusalem. So that happened in 1967, and uh, Israel occupied these areas, and um, of course, lots of things happened. Since 67, but this piece of land is still under Israeli occupation. Israel has uh, filled it with the settlements, which make it very, very difficult to establish a, a, a state over there. They're always talking about two state solution. When they spoke about that, they mentioned the West Bank and East Jerusalem, maybe uh, as one state, as a Palestinian state, and of course, Israel is a second state. But since there are uh, these, the, the, more than 600,000 Jewish settlers in the West Bank, it has become almost impossible. For a lot of people say it's impossible to have a Palestinian state over there when you have all these Jewish settlements uh, in it. So uh, Gaza Strip was disconnected from uh, Israel uh, in a unilater unilateral um, step that they took, uh, not in a peace treaty, they just uh, pulled out, but it's still considered by most of the world that uh, it's occupied because Israel uh, controls the borders. They prevent them from doing a lot of things. And of course, every now and then, every two or three years, you have uh, small wars between Israel 
rocket and missiles and you know uh, balloons fire uh, fire balloons between uh, Gaza and Israel. Okay, the third group. So this group, when, you, when they talk about peace treaty, they mainly talk about the West Bank and Gaza and two-state solution and uh, you know the, the Trump uh, peace treaty, the last one, which is what was ridiculous. Most of people here, Palestinians here, saw that it was just uh, talk. It was ridiculous. Nobody would accept it. But anyway, they talk about that, those areas, the West Bank and Gaza. The third group is the group that I belong to, and this is the people who, uh, for different reasons, just stayed where they were in 1948. They did not run away and they were not dragged out. For example, Nazareth, uh, the Jewish troops came to Nazareth and the local leadership, the local Arab Palestinian leadership just surrendered and accepted the rule of, the, um, of Israel. Uh, they were put all these, the, the number of, uh, our number was 150,000 people in 1948. As you remember in the beginning today, it's almost 2 million, but the, we were 150,000. We were put under military occupation until 1966. And uh, people could not travel without a special permit and so on, but uh, it was lifted in 1966. We were given the Israeli uh, citizenship and we could vote for the government, for the Knesset and so on. So we are full Israeli citizens today. Uh, second class citizens, I dare say, it's, uh, it's not a secret and I'm not being radical, I'm just <laughs> stating the facts. We are second class citizens as uh, Arab Palestinians living in Israel, but we are full Israeli citizens. So as you can see, this complication now is in our identity. So. As an Arab Palestinian, I'm an Arab, speak Arabic, I was born in an Arab family, this is my mother language. Palestinian because I'm not Egyptian, I'm not Algerian, but I'm from this area, which has special customs and special culture. So I'm also Palestinian, I'm also Israeli at the same time, I'm Israeli citizen, full Israeli citizen. I speak Hebrew better than English. I studied in the Hebrew University. I read Hebrew and write Hebrew and, you know, it's, uh, I'm an Israeli citizen. For, for good and for worse. So, uh, so I'm a minority, small number as I shared, you know, as Christians, we are 1.5% of the whole population in a minority, in the Arab minority, which is 21%. And I'm also evangelical, which is a small minority in Christians and Christians, a small minority among Muslims uh, or among Arabs and um, uh, in a Jewish country as well. So as you can see, my citizenship as Israeli, I go, I travel around the world with my Israeli passport, but uh, contradicts with my nationality as Arab, as Palestinian. You know, we have this war with, with Gaza. I'm not going to cheer when Israel is uh, bombing uh, my people in Gaza, even though, you know, I, I disapprove what Hamas does and I hate their values and that, but still, you know, I'm Palestinian. So there is this difficulty, or when they do something bad in the West Bank or whatever. So it's citizenship, citizenship versus nationality. Israel accepts me, uh, uh, wants me to, to cheer and be, they call it loyal, you know, to Israel and disregard my uh, Palestinian side. But these are in, in a conflict. How can I just side with, with one when my values, my faith, um, tells me not to, but to try to be just. And then of course there is, I'm Christian, I live among Muslims here. Also there is this, this kind of uh, uh, contradiction and tension between both. Uh, Nazareth has 70, even Nazareth, the hometown of Jesus has 70% are Muslim and 30% only are Christian from all denominations. And then as a Baptist myself, you know, we are, our number as Baptists is something like 2,000 people out of the 100, uh, 135,000 uh, Christians. So it's a very tiny minority. Uh, and uh, as you, you see that other places in Europe and other places, you know, the, the big group, unfortunately, the big Christian group marginalizes the small group. So in our case, it's the Catholics, they are the big numbers and they, um, uh, disregard us and try to put us in the margin and so on. So 
that's sort of uh, you know where we stand. I gave you the background and where we stand. So in Israel, they look at us as Arabs, me as an Arab Christian. They never look at me as a sort of human being, an Israeli citizen. No, 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 you're different. You're the other. And as a result, there's inequality and marginalization. This is seen in different things, you know, in budgets and how they deal with us and job opportunities and so on. Uh, Israel being a Jewish country, how do you as a minority live there? Uh, what are your rights and so on? The inner Arab society, they don't look at us. The Muslims don't look at us. Ah, you're Arab, you're a fellow Arab. We are one like another. We are the same. No, 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 you are Christian. How oh, different too. And then, um, let me share a little bit about the Christians. And the, you know, maybe also a comment, a, a footnote here about Christians. A lot of people think, oh, Arabs equals Muslim. Uh, Arabs equals Osama bin Laden, or I don't know who. But uh, a lot of people don't know that there are Christians, and there were Christians before Islam. And if you read your Bible closely, in Acts 2, when he talks about the day of Pentecost and the groups that were in Jerusalem, the Jewish groups who came to uh, Jerusalem for the feast, uh, the last one mentioned there were Arabs. So, and we know from history that there were Arab, uh, Arab people spoke Arabic who uh, became Christians, got to know the Lord, and there were uh, Christian tribes before Islam. Some are very well famous. Menadira, Assassina, these are names of uh, Arab uh, tribes, Christian Arab tribes before Islam, which came uh, about 600, uh, the year 600. And of course, the Arab Christians uh, are, uh, there are about 15 million uh, around the Middle East. The largest number is in Egypt, about 10 million. Plus, there are uh, disputes about the numbers, but um, uh, about 15 million all around the Middle East. In Iraq, there were larger numbers, of course, after the war, the numbers went down a little bit, not a little bit, uh, substantially. In Syria, there were about 1 million also, but it's mainly Egypt. Of course, this is the area, the most difficult area, the 1040 window uh, of all these countries that are uh, with severe persecution and very anti-Christian area. And uh, five out of uh, 12 countries in, I think it's um, one of the organizations that uh, monitors uh, human rights and uh, the freedom of religion uh, had five out of the 12 most severe persecu persecution in Arab countries. And uh, Okay, go forward. So another um, little bit painful uh, area that we have this uh, contradiction and tension in our identity is between being evangelical and being Palestinian or being Arab. Uh, most churches in the West, in different, it's a different range, you know, of uh, of love to Israel. I'm not anti-Israel myself. I'm Israeli myself, but uh, some are very, very pro-Israeli and uh, unconditionally, with no regard to the Palestinians. And some would go to, to say, well, Christian Palestinians just, there's not, nothing, there's no Palestinians, they would tell you. Christians, Arabs, there's nothing like that. You should just be, uh, you know, you're a nuisance for us, for God's plan, you should just leave. Just imagine, you live somewhere, you've been living here for, uh, sixth, seventh generation here in Israel, Palestine, whatever, and somebody tells you, ah, oh, you don't fit here because God decided that you, you should not be here and you should go away because you're a nuisance and you're disturbing the plan of God. Of course, these are extreme, very, very extreme uh, evangelicals, but uh, there's a range of them. And a large number of them, uh, it's very harming for our testimony. It's very harming for our witness here. Uh, as, Arab, as Arabs, as Palestinians, we live among our people and love our people and want to serve our people and want, and want our people to know Jesus as their savior. But then they open the TV and they hear about a pastor who's also Baptist like me, who says things that are outrageous, outrageous. I want to hide behind the, 
uh, beneath the table, you know, of, of shame, of shame. When people, somebody in Florida, I don't know, starts talking against Muhammad. Come on. If you're uh, such a hero, come uh, say that in, uh, in Baghdad or in Amman. Let me, let me see you. But they, they want to show themselves as hero, as brave, but they do that in their own uh, mansions in America. When, uh, you know, and we are the ones that are hit here, and our, our message, our witness, our testimony is, is hurt because of, uh, of uh, this one-sided uh, anti-Muslim, anti-Palestinian, anti, I don't know what. Anyway, uh, I'll stop there. You understand the difficulty here of being evangelical uh, and the Palestinian at the same time. Okay, um, maybe I'll stop here a little bit. I can, sh I can share a little bit about education. I've given you a lot of background, political, historical, and about our identity here, but you know, for you to get to know uh, who we are. If anybody wants to, maybe, what time is it? Okay. Um, yeah, if anybody has any comment or wants to say something, I'll give you a chance and I can drink something and then I can go forward for another 10 minutes and then we can have more questions if you want. Oh, Tris, I didn't understand what you meant to 1040 window. It's the, uh, I think in English, altitude you call it, you know, the, the, line, the lines. Uh, uh, Andy, can you help me with that? Latitude. It's the latitude, latitude. lines. Latitude. Yeah, so from is, yeah. 10 degrees to 40 degrees yeah, on yeah, yeah, yeah. the latitude yeah. lines. Yeah, it's uh, this area, if you look at it in the world uh, map, it's a difficult area with lots of Muslim countries that are very, very anti-Christian and very, very closed country dictatorships and so on. Yeah. Your role with evangelical churches, that is one of the aims there to draw together people from across, right across the the potential divides. I mean, are there there are Arab Christian churches and Messianic churches within that that grouping? Actually, no. Uh, it's okay. only uh, the the organization that I I had. It's uh, the Arab Evangelical Churches. It does not have Jewish. The, the Jewish. Uh, assemblies or congregations, they do not call themselves Christian, of course. They don't call themselves no. evangelical, they call themselves uh, messianic uh, congregations. Um, we have relationships with them. I'm part of, I'm on the board of Musalaha, which is a reconciliation ministry that works between Arab and Jewish believers. Uh, and we have other forums that we work with them. But in general, uh, unfortunately, Israel has like a segregation type of uh, uh, living even in schools as well as in ministry. Although we, our faith is very, very close, you'll find maybe 90% of what we believe is uh, similar between us and Messianic Jews, but uh, the 10% of uh, the theology of the land sometimes creates uh, difficulties. And, uh, but still, there are, there's a college that has students from both places, there are ministry, uh, there's a gathering here uh, not very far from Nazareth every year of Messianics and Arabs together and so on. Uh, the ministry that John works with also has Arabs and Jews together. Uh, IEF is one of the uh, few ministries that works with both, you know, which is good and brings together both. We just had a, a meeting, a Zoom meeting, unfortunately, um, two months ago or so. Uh, of uh, principles of schools that from the Messianic community as well as from the uh, evangelical community. So we have cooperation, we have relationships, but we are not par part of this organization uh, together, but uh, you know, we cooperate on different things. Yeah. Okay, um, let me go forward a little bit and you can ask questions then. In, in, uh, Education, what I'm going to share is also uh, broad and not uh, specifically about the evangelical education in Israel. I'll share about that, but I don't have it in my uh, PowerPoint. Okay, Arab children use uh, the public school, um, some private schools, uh, as, but also a church school system. They call it church, church school system, uh, which is a Christian school system that uh, 
us in uh, Nazareth Baptist School, we part of that, and I was part of the executive committee of uh, the Secretary of Christian Schools. That's an interesting story in itself. Uh, I'll share a little bit about it. In 2014, the government, uh, let me back off a little bit. The Christian schools um, are like charter schools in America where we get partial funding from the government. Partial, but it's quite a big load, a big, uh, big chunk of, uh, of money from the government as well as tuition. So we're, we're not 100% private. It's not 100% funded by the tuition and fundraising. No, we get money from the government. And as a, a result, we uh, need to abide to the curriculum of the Ministry of Education. We're under the Ministry of Education, but we have some liberty. So in 2014, the government cut, uh, there were severe cuts of uh, the budget we got. And as a result, the Christian schools uh, found that they could not continue to, op uh, to, to operate. And as a result, in 2015, there was a big strike of almost one month, at the beginning of September, uh, until the 28th of uh, September, uh, all the Christian schools in Israel, 47, uh, 37 of them, uh, went to strike. At that time, because I'm a lawyer, as well as you know, I speak English, uh, our school is a respected school, the, there was a secretariat for the Catholic schools. They are the majority. The, the, the Catholic schools are something like 80% of all the uh, Christian schools in Israel. So they asked me to join them. And as a result, we changed their name from secretariat of Catholic schools to a secretariat of Christian schools, which was nice. And uh, we, then we had uh, negotiations with the government and at that time, the Minister of Education was Naftali Bennett, who today is the Prime Minister. And uh, I met with him a few times, you know, for this uh, negotiations. We had a big demonstration also in Jerusalem and one in, Ju in Nazareth here near the Basilica, the big Basilica. And uh, there, um, at the end, there was a solution. It was not, you know, the best solution in the world, but it helped us to continue and later on, you know, slowly, slowly, we got more, uh, and the, the budget was, was back, and uh, we can continue and go forward. So, number of uh, Arab students, and uh, all the students in Israel are 2.2 million students. There's a big debate now if they're going to start uh, their school year on the 1st of uh, September because of COVID. They're not sure about it. They decided they are starting, but uh, the last two days they're saying we should reconsider. They're not sure. Uh, Arab students, 440,000. Church schools are 33,000 students. As I said earlier, um, 37 schools. The non Catholic, you can see Greek Orthodox, Anglican Baptist. Baptist, that's our school, as a Baptist school. And Church of Scotland. There's a school in Jaffa called the Tabitha School. Jaffa, also part of the non-Catholic schools. I was the representative of the non-Catholics in the Secretariat of the Christian Schools in Israel. Um, Christian schools have um, about 40% are Muslim students, 60% Christian students. This is a picture of uh, the demonstration I mentioned. This is uh, the Bank of Israel in the middle of the picture. And there were 10,000 people. That was on the 9th. At the 10th of uh, September 2015, a Sunday, uh, we, uh, a lot of people came, did not go to church, but we had uh, some Christian hymns also, and uh, in the demonstration, it was a great gathering, one of a kind, you know, never Christian schools or the Christian community went out to demonstrate because of uh, what, what we were facing. The picture down there is from the Ministry of, uh, from uh, a, um, a committee in the Knesset. Um, I think it was the education uh, committee. Uh, this is uh, Bishop Marcuzzo, who is Italian, he speaks uh, fluent Arabic, Roman Catholic bishop, and we spoke, uh, we were there at that, that day and we spoke to the members of the Knesset. Yeah, more pictures. Uh, this is a small demonstration that we had in Jerusalem also. Uh, press conference down here is an interesting picture. It was at the beginning of the struggle. 
uh, as you can see sitting on the right side is uh, Rivlin, who was the president of Israel. You know, in Israel, the president is like the Queen of England, you know, or just an honorary thing. It was just replaced by another guy, Herzog, but uh, Rivlin, he tried to mediate between us and try to find a solution for our problem. On the other side, on the left side, is Naftali Bennett. He, you see the Minister of Education at that time, today the Prime Minister of Israel. And that's me standing uh, behind the bishop, on the left side of the bishop, with a tie, not like today. Okay, uh, Christian schools were established. Um, one school started 400 years ago. And um, of course, every church wants to have something in the Holy Land. In Jerusalem, in Nazareth, it would be lovely to have an Anglican school in Jerusalem, Anglican school in Nazareth. That's great. Baptist school in Nazareth, a Catholic school in Tiberias, Tiber they don't have. But anyway, uh, and as a result, even before Israel was established, there were these uh, Christian schools established here and there. And the local Christians, like my grandfathers, my great grandfathers, uh, benefited from this, this fact. And they went to school early, and that helped, and that gave sort of an advantage for the Christian community in the Holy Land. So today, the segment of Arab Christians in Israel is the most educated among all segments of society. I'll repeat that. The segment of Arab Christians in Israel is the most educated uh, among all segments of society in Israel, even more than the Jewish. Of course, the Jewish is much, much, much uh, uh, larger than the Christian, which is one and a half percent. But, uh, and, you know, you'll have uh, European Jews who are very educated, but at the same time, they'll have also Orthodox uh, Jews who, uh, who are not educated. So, uh, but that uh, factor, these schools were a reason why our community became quite educated. Today, you will find uh, that among, there are three times more Arab Christian doctors than the percentage in the whole uh, society, and so on. Okay, these are some of the re reasons uh, why they were uh, more educated, the establishment of the church schools by European American Catholic Protestant churches, uh, Palestine at the time was under uh, the backward uh, rule, Turkish rule. At the same time, there was this light coming from these schools that the missionaries, Catholic and Protestant missionaries, uh, started in uh, the whole Middle East. In, also in Amman, in Be Beirut, there's a university, a Presbyterian University, an American university in, in Cairo, and so on, as well as schools, of course. And then, of course, because we are a small minority, uh, whenever there is a minority, they want to excel. They, they, they don't have the large numbers. They don't have the, the strength of a big, a big consist, constituency or a vote in the, in the Knesset, for example. So we aim to excel uh, academically in order to uh, have a better life and to be heard. Then the Christians in general, because they, are, they were taught in these European and American uh, schools, were more open, more open, uh, mixed schools, boys and girls, affiliation with the West, you know, lots of the families. Unfortunately, that's a negative part is that people immigrate to America, to Australia, to Canada, to Europe. Uh, but at the same time, it brings uh, openness and affiliation with the West and uh, with the more advanced uh, areas of the world. Uh, Christians are less religious, according to some uh, polls, but uh, even these religious people, uh, the church is not restraining them. I think uh, Catholic Church, for example, or any Protestant church does not say, oh, science is bad or something. No, no, no. It's different than uh, in other places. So also the Christian schools are the same thing here. This is a picture with the, the prime minister. That's me with the tie over there, and this is Naftali uh, Bennett. But uh, the Christian schools have this difficulty because they are Arab at the same time. It's the same thing like what I shared before about the identity. You're Arab and you're Israeli at the same time. We are part of the general system, Arab system, which is uh, backward. Uh, 
socioeconomic inequality, but we have special characteristics as Christian schools. Um, this is about funding. This green, green uh, 19, 19,704, that's the money that we get from the government. And if you compare it to other groups in Israel, uh, the religious group gets the 30,780. Anyway, the purple one on the, on the right side is the average, 24,000. We get less. So you can see inequality in uh, education. Okay, I'll go forward here. Um, yeah, the achievements of our schools is very high. Entitlement uh, of the government, uh, the GROOT, we call it certificate, is 81%. In our school, it's 96, actually, in Azerbaijan school which means that from the class of last year, 96% of the, the children or the students who finished high school were entitled to a, uh, a group certificate. They finished all their uh, duties and they, they could uh, graduate. While in Israel, the average is 65%. Then there is the ex excellence in the group exams. There is a special criteria of who is an excellent student. In the Christian schools, it's 15%. In our school last year, it was about 40%. Very, very high. Just imagine out of all the students who graduated, 40% of them are considered excellent, while the average in Israel is 7.2% only. This is um, from Haaretz. Um, this is an old one. It's 2009. I put an arrow near each school that uh, that time were uh, at the percentage of excellent the graduates. Number four is the Baptist school, our school, with 31% who are excellent. And then there is St. Joseph, and the other St. Joseph, two St. Joseph's, and there is the Orthodox school also in Haifa. Uh, that's the highest in all the country. Of uh, So you have four Christian schools out of these, I don't know, 15 or 12, uh, 15. 15 schools who are excellent in all Israel. Yeah, more information. We have the graduates from all around. This is Johnny Struji. He's number two in Apple. Um, he's from Haifa. Two judges in the high court are uh, Christian uh, from our schools. Um, very good judges. Medical doctors, heads of departments, heads of hospitals. Because the schools are... Um, excellent academically, sometimes the government uh, accuses the schools that, you know, people become um, too educated, so they become nationalistic, intelligentsia, so even members of Knesset, most of them are uh, graduates of these Christian schools, although most of these people here are Muslim, all of them, except the, the two, uh, the two this, these are uh, the two in the down, uh, the two, and uh, what's his name? What's his name? A Christian, but all the rest are Muslim. So the educational system, quite educated Western, fragmented, unfortunately, among the different denominations and sometimes you know politics. Uh, we do not have political backing in Israel itself because our numbers are very small and we are fragmented. And then this relationship with the establishment, it's a love-hate relationship. And uh, from my experience, the uh, share is uh, what helped us during the strike that I mentioned was the intervention from abroad. Uh, you know, with all humility, but what, what happened was that we had a chance to speak to a delegation from America higher ranked delegation that came from America to see a church, a loaves and fishes church that was burned in, in Tiberias. And we had a chance to talk to them about the crisis of the Christian schools. And that made a difference. They met with Naftali Bennett and because it was American official uh, delegation, things st started ch changing and uh, things could, uh, could move forward. And we met with British and we met with the German and so on. So that helped uh, a lot. So. Because of our weak weakness and small numbers, uh, sometimes the only thing we can do is try to get backing from uh, abroad. 
Christian, school, uh, Christian uh, churches abroad or uh, personalities from abroad. Okay, you would ask, you know, I did not share a lot about the evangelical community in itself, but more of a general, but we can talk about it in the, with the questions. But if you ask me, what can I do? You know, I want to be involved. I want to support you. I want to be a, a good brother, a, a brother that really uh, is united with you, with uh, the blood of Christ, as I shared at the beginning. Be a real friend. Be a real friend of Jesus, of, of Israel. Uh, and ask your friend, if Israel is your friend, ask Israel how do you deal with your Arab citizens? Because that's a test of a true friendship. If I have a friend and I know that, uh, sorry, he beats his wife and I don't say anything, then I'm not a real friend. And I think the Bible in Proverbs, it says, let's see how they, uh, how we uh, translate that to English. Uh, deceitful are the wounds of, uh, deceitful are the kisses of the enemy and uh, faithful are the wounds of the friend, something like that. That's, that's from Proverbs, that's the translation. So pursue peace in Israel, you know, ask for peace. Uh, peace is good for the Jews and for the, for the Arabs too. Uh, don't be one-sided. and Don't accept oppression of one group against the other. Uh, get acquainted with what's happening, like what you're doing today. I know some of what I said, maybe you don't like it so much, or maybe it's a little bit harsh, you can see it, or it's a little bit negative. I don't know, it's okay. But you heard me out, and I appreciate that, and that's good. It will help you get acquainted of hearing the different uh, views, and I'm happy what Andy shared that we are having this, and we're hearing more people. That's a, that's a commendable thing. That's that's how true believers and true uh, educated and people who understand uh, would do. Hear all, get acquainted really with what's happening here. And uh, visit the Arab community, the Arab the Palestinian Christian community when you tour the Holy Land. Come and visit us in the school in Nazareth. Be on, on a Sunday, go and worship with uh, a church that's close to you, you know, a Baptist church, an evangelical church, an Anglican church, a Catholic, whatever, I don't mind. Uh, wherever you feel, uh, and get to know the people, get to know the living stones. A lot of people come to the country and uh, just you know, visit the dead stones. Come and visit the living stones also, and be an advocate for Arab Christians. You know, um, it's not that we're poor people. You know, we don't we need this protection always. But in in certain cases, we might need that protection, uh, like people other places. For example, believers in Afghanistan today need protection and need intervention. Today, we don't need it here. Maybe some other time we might need it, uh, God forbid, and you might need it some, some time, God forbid. But uh, uh, let's, um, you know, uh, watch for uh, each other's back, you know, as they say. Uh, love each other. Uh, be real. Sorry, I, I jumped here. Let me stop this and stop sharing. Yeah. Um, so, um, be a real brother, you know, the, who was it? Kane, Kane asked, uh, am I my brother's uh, guard? Or the other way around, Hebrew, I think he said, am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, be, a, be your brother's keeper. And uh, if there's a need, you know, stand, if you're in a better position in the country you are in, or you have connections, somewhere or another, pray for, for us, and we will pray for you. Let's get acquainted with one another and, uh, um, support one another for the glory of Christ and because we want the church of God all around the world to be strong and not to face uh, difficulties. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Boutros. Very, 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 very helpful overview. And uh, zooming in on education, it just it helps fill out the picture and um, we're grateful to you. Um, we have a few, John Woodhead, we're very nice to see you, John. Glad you'll be able to, to join us. Um, and um, are there any questions that folks would like to, to put in these last few, few minutes? How, how could you say a wee bit more, Boutros, about how we could be advocates for, um, for 
particularly for, for Arab Christians within an integral context. In, in which context, sorry? It, you know, Arab Christians in the context that you, yeah. you set for us. With what you are doing, you know, getting acquainted, pray for us, uh, partner with us. Uh, maybe your church wants to send people or uh, accept, have a mission uh, week where you accept people from uh, our community to come and share about our struggles. Uh, pray for us, support uh, by prayer or by resources, maybe people that uh, can come and live in the country and help, or by money, or, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. share about our story, share our story with, uh, with mm -hmm. people. Our community. Thank, thank you so much, Butrus. That was so helpful because sadly my bias has been very much towards the Israeli nationalist kind of context and that really was very, very helpful and corrective for me. Um, the recent conflict from the West Bank, Hamas and Israel, the IDF or whatever, there seemed to be a new thing, the, the breakdown throughout Israel between Jew, Jew, young people, Jewish and Arab. Has that left a, a lasting difficulty or has there been healing? What's the current situation there in on the ground tensions at, at village level and town level? Um, you know, time heals. Um, and I think, you know, we're talking about May now, we're almost September, so some time has uh, gone by. So uh, time has healed this and people forget. We're used, unfortunately, we are used to uh, war, you know, where people feel bad about the other community and then uh, peace comes. So, yeah, we, and then there is co coexistence, people come back to, to live together and everything. So it's a little slowly, slowly it's healing, I think. Um, especially that there is an Arab party for the first time, part of the coalition. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> paradoxically, it's a, a Muslim movement uh, They decided to change its direction and they are part of the coalition. They, they do not have a minister in uh, the government, but they are part of uh, the coalition, which is uh, the, the group of... Uh, members of Knesset that are supporting the government. And if they are not happy, then the government will fall and then it will go, we will go to elections and there, it will be dissolved, the government. Because all these people came together against Netanyahu. He was uh, uh, people from the far right, even more right wing than Netanyahu, like Bennett himself, right? Like Saar, the Minister of the Interior, I think today is you know, a Minister of Judiciary. And then there are people who are leftist, very liberal, uh, LGTB uh, groups, and they're very pro-Palestinian. And then there is this Muslim conservative group, also part of that same coalition. So it's a very odd, very strange coalition we have in Israel, but part of it is an Arab uh, party, a Muslim party, an Islamic party, which also I think a little bit helped in an indirect way so to ease uh, things, you know, that at the end of the day, maybe there were people who, uh, you know, there were clashes all around, in May because of the frustration and so on. But at the end of the day, people see the bigger picture that at the end of the day, we are talking about 2 million Arab Palestinians living in Israel. And um, the vast majority of them are peaceful people that just want to have their lives go, go, go forward and uh, to live in a peaceful way. So. Yeah, things are changing, I think, to the better, better. Thanks. Butrus is, together with myself, part of four people who founded the IEF. And there was an IEF registered in Israel, and then the IEF registered in Scotland. And the IEF stands for the Israel Education for Forum. So... The focus was very much on education. And uh, things have moved on uh, a little bit uh, and the work in Israel uh, between the schools and the colleges and that uh, uh, kind of uh, ground to a halt uh, about 10 years ago. 
but now, at least on the school side, uh, out here, as Butchers alluded to, the meeting of principals, and we are starting with that for them to take the ownership of developing uh, the school's uh, education amongst those with an evangelical faith uh, out here uh, in Israel. And, uh, and, and, and Butrus was leading that first meeting. I unfortunately could, could not be at it. Uh, I was away, but uh, Butrus led that. But what I was wanting to, to say is that within the IEF today, what we're trying to set up is specialist uh, ministry groups that would uh, support different aspects of work and ministry in Israel according to needs in Israel and according to uh, interests that exists in Scotland. And we do have uh, uh, a school's ministry group as well. And, uh, and, and the whole idea is, is that our group ministry from Scotland will work together with, <laughs> with uh, the, the principals in Israel in, so that we are part of this work that's going on to develop the school education uh, in Israel. It's, uh, they will have the ownership of the work, we'll be there in a supportive uh, capacity. But it, it's one of the ways, and the principles group, as Butra said, is both Jews and Arabs uh, in it. It's, it's, it's everybody who's, who's got an evangelical faith in it, and Butras is definitely one of the leading ones, and he and I have quite a bit of contact. We're both good friends for many, many years, but also uh, on issues like this, we also work very closely together. Yeah, let, let me share a little bit about what we have with the schools. Um, our school here in Nazareth, Nazareth Baptist School, is a K-12 school with 1,000 students. Um, and the features I mentioned about the Christian schools in, includes, uh, it's, it's, it's a good school. Um, there are, there's a, a Messianic school in Jerusalem that just recently got uh, uh, registered and recognized by the Ministry of Education. They're moving and they're expanding quite nicely. Uh, still a small school, really, to be, I think 150 students or something like that, but uh, they're moving and uh, they were part of the meeting that we had that uh, John mentioned. There's a small school, also a Messianic school in Tiberias, not very far from here, and we had a program together, our school, where their students came and spent some time with our students, but it's a small school also. And then there are two, uh, at least two international schools, big schools, the Anglican School in Jerusalem. Uh, these are not recognized as Israeli uh, uh, schools like our school or the Messianic one, but uh, schools that uh, teach uh, children of uh, diplomats and so on, and they teach in English. So the Anglican School in Jerusalem and Tabitha uh, School in, uh, in Jaffa. Actually, Tabitha is also uh, semi-recognized in Israel, but... Uh, with uh, John's efforts, you know, uh, we had a uh, few conferences together where Arab and Jewish uh, uh, believing uh, teachers came together and here, uh, spent a day together where they heard the lectures and uh, uh, it was good. I think it was very active. We had a qu quite an active uh, group. We're try trying to revive it now again. Uh, we started with the principals, but uh, it's a worthy uh, ministry to, to support. Each one is different than the other, you know, as I told you, we're an Arab school, a big school. They are much smaller, but uh, in a different community, but still, uh, you know, the faith is issues are the same at the end of the day. And how do you teach your, your values, how you, you teach your faith in a uh, non-believing uh, environment? Our case, for example, most of our students are not from uh, believing families. In their case, the Messianic school, it's... Uh, almost all of the parents are messianic, so it's, it's different a little bit, but still we can learn from one another. I was just going to say, I Patrice, did. are there any limitations put on your schools in terms of what kind of religious education is taught? Uh, good question. Um, we're walking on a very thin line. And traditionally, um, we had chapel for all our students, including Muslim students, which is very, very uh, special. You know, just imagine Muslim parents paying tuition for their students to be in school. 
where they uh, study chap where they have chapel and they have Bible classes. Um, recently, the government has tried to be more and more involved in and, uh, uh, putting some limits, but we're still on a thin line because we are a good school. Um, we are able to continue um, uh, putting our terms for the parents. You know, if you want your kid in the school, then they will have to be part of the whole curriculum, and that includes also Bible and chapel. And we, we try to dialogue with the parents and tell them, you know, nobody ever was uh, harmed by studying uh, Bible, you know. We, uh, as an Arab kid, you know, I studied um, Islam uh, in history and in Arabic, not as a religion, not as a separate class, but in the history of Islam, as well as the, the, the Arabic language, lots of uh, Quranic um, messages. So why don't your kids out of, you know, our living together, because just why don't they also study uh, Bible? And it's mainly accepted, this, what we share. So we don't have any limitations. We try to be wise and not to push our luck too much. But uh, uh, we, we are able to teach about Jesus, about his crucifixion, about him being the only savior and so on and so on. Uh, Pray to God that uh, that will continue. We will be able to continue to do that. Because I think probably we should um, draw to a close there with uh, thanks to the Boutros. And I mean, I think one of the things you've done for us is just to to help us in our praying uh, as one one part of it. And it strikes me there can be fewer things that are more on God's heart than the unity of His people. I think that's high up on his agenda. I mean, you take John 17 as a primary example of that, but I think right through the scriptures, the, the binding together of God's people as you, united in Christ is just so significant. And even to pray at that level, you've given us fresh um, encouragement to, to pray for that within God's people in, in Israel. And the, and the dynamic that that can be in terms of um, of mission and uh, witness. But we want to pray too for you, Boutros, because you're in a very significant position and um, and obviously with your contacts with um, education authorities more generally, the, just the significance of that and the opportunity that brings is, uh, is vitally important. I've put in the notes uh, the names of Boutros' book, books to look up and also the IEF website address because we'd love if you wanted to know more about IEF and uh, particularly the conference that we're planning for the 10th of Saturday the, the 10th of sorry the 30th of October um, when we'll have a, a half day conference is the plan that will be some in person and some um, uh, streaming online and um, We'd, we'd love you to, to be part of that with John Woodhead, uh, doing something which, I, as far as I'm concerned, is, is unique, where he, he takes um, passages from the Bible but brings a historical geography approach, bringing his archaeology and historical geography skill to interpreting that passage. And he's done that several times uh, for us at these conferences. And really, I, I don't think there's anywhere else you hear that kind of um, exposition of God's words, so it really is worth that, plus hearing out what else is happening in the Israel context. We'll, we'll let you know about that, um, on, but do look for the website for more information as we see how we're going to handle that, given the, the, um, the way that uh, restrictions go, both here and in Israel. But um, I think we'll, we'll call it a day there, and uh, We'd love just to pray for you, Boutros, as we, as we finish. Father, we, we bring to you uh, the many things that are on Boutros' heart and want to pray specifically for him as he seeks to reach out uh, to other Arab Christians, to other schools, uh, to Messianic believers, as he seeks to encourage those in evangelical churches, 
as he seeks to liaise with, uh, with government. Lord, we pray especially that you would give him real wisdom as he does that and renewed strength and um, particularly just the the ability to rely on you for all the the the, the stresses and strains that that brings, and that you would renew it in his in his spirit, renew it in it with a great renewed sense of your love for him, and your uh, the way that you are seeking to use him. Pray for all these relationships that ask that they might be really strong and and growing, and that you would keep him and his wife and family. Uh, under the shadow of your love, the shadow of your wing, and that they would sense your protection in heart and mind. So we commit uh, this, all that we've learned to you, and pray, as we prayed at the start, that we would be good stewards of this, this fresh knowledge, and, uh, and the insight we've gained might move us to prayer and to greater commitment to your work uh, within the land of Israel as we commit ourselves to you now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for joining with us for this lecture. For more information about future lectures, please visit our website, www.iefinternational.com, or contact us directly via our email address, info at iefinternational.com. We hope that you have been blessed by what has been shared and we look forward to connecting with you in the future.